This podcast is brought to you by PLI, the Practicing Law Institute. PLI is committed to keeping you ever current on the dynamic trends shaping the legal world. Learn more at pli.edu slash ftpod. Welcome to Fast Tracked, Emergent Issues in the Legal Profession, brought to you by the Practicing Law Institute. I'm your host, Jen Leonard, founder of Creative Lawyers. Buckle up as we hit the gas and explore the most dynamic trends shaping the legal world, from generative AI to DE&I and everything in between. I hope you'll join us as we explore the future of law today. On today's episode, we hear from the Honorable Bridget McCormick, CEO of the American Arbitration Association, and Andrew Perlman, Dean of Suffolk University Law School, about generative AI and access to justice. I hope you enjoy this insightful discussion. We are thrilled today to be joined by two of the most preeminent leaders in our profession, Bridget McCormick and Andy Perlman. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for being on the Fast Track Podcast. Pleasure to join you, Jen. Yeah, it's great to be here, Jen. We are here today to talk about the future of access to justice, to talk about generative AI, to talk about technology generally, and also to touch upon what all of this means for the future of lawyers and for legal education, because both of you have prominent roles in all of those spaces, including legal education. So we'll try to touch on some of that at the end of our conversation. But before we dive into the details about what's happening in our spaces around generative AI, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I'll start with you, Bridget. If you could give an assessment, in your opinion, of the current state of the civil justice system. I know you've spent years thinking about this, advocating for new approaches. What does the landscape look like where we sit today? Yeah. Well, thanks for the question and the conversation. It's going to be fun. I'm really delighted to join two of my, uh, two people who I consider heroes in thinking about the future of the profession. And so it's lucky, lucky me to be here. At first, I should say that I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, not only in my current role, which I've only been in for 11 months, but my immediately previous role as the chief justice of the state of Michigan, where we had admitting the Supreme Court, like most Supreme Courts had administrative oversight of all the courts of the state. I, I spent a good deal of my time thinking about the civil justice system and some of its its failures. And then I had an academic career before that where I thought a lot about it as well. But so, so, so to answer your question directly, I would say the state of the civil justice system is not strong. It is sort of hard to, to explain with data because justice system data is so hard to come by. But there are a few data points, and I feel like I'm about to start channeling our mutual friend, Jim Sandman, that do capture the failures of the civil justice system. The Legal the legal Services Corporation's 2022 Justice Gap ref- report found that 92% of the civil legal problems that low-income people in America face get either no or inadequate legal help. And that is not a, a result of any kind of pandemic blip. There has been increased funding in recent years and also increased failures of the civil justice system. Another data point is the National Center for State Courts estimates that both parties have lawyers in only 24% of civil cases in state courts. State courts, of course, is where most justice is meted out. It's where most people go if they need justice or most people go when someone wants justice from them. 95% of civil litigation happens in state courts. So in other words, in more than three quarters of civil cases, at least one party struggles to navigate a legal system where rules are written in a language they don't speak or understand, which sounds unfair. And then this last one, which usually arrests most people, the World Justice Project ranks the world's countries on their compliance with various measures of the rule of law. And one of those measures is the accessibility and the affordability of civil justice. And in the most recent rule of law index, which was released late last year, so we should be getting a new one soon, Uh, the United States ranks 115th out of 140 countries on the accessibility and affordability of civil justice. And among the 43 wealthiest countries, the United States ranks 43rd. A lot of other countries do justice better than we do. So why don't I I take a breath? Because I'm sure Andy has contributions to, to make to that, to this assessment as well. Those are certainly alarming statistics and data points. And I want to come back to some of them, but I do want to turn to Andy and ask for his thoughts. 
Yeah, first of all, the hero worship goes the other way. Bridget, I've been a long admirer of yours. The pioneering work that you did in the Michigan courts is really inspiring to try to address some of these issues. And I hope we have an opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the practical realities of addressing the issues that you flag, which are serious and growing only worse, despite the investments that we've made along a number of different lines. So Jen, coming back to your question about what is the root cause of all of this and how might we try to address it? The way that I've thought about it in the past is that we have tried three different approaches to address the issues that Bridget has raised. One is that we have asked lawyers to engage in more pro bono work. Two, we have invested more money in civil legal services that you know, you've already heard about. And then three, in some instances, we've tried to create a civil Gideon right, a right to counsel on certain civil legal matters. All three of those areas are important and we need to continue to focus on them, but we know they're not enough. And we know that because the problems have only gotten worse over time. That number, which is 92% now, was in the 80s before that and then in the 70s. So it's just getting worse over time. And so, you know, it's useful to think about why that is and why the United States is so far behind the rest of the world in these and other areas when it comes to civil justice. And I think there are a few possible answers to that question. One of them, and citing and quoting again our mutual friend Jim Salmon, um, is procedural complexity. I've heard Jim say on a number of uh, different occasions, and I completely agree with him, that our current system was created by lawyers for lawyers. And we have built up a very complicated structure for people to navigate, which really makes it difficult for people to access the legal services that they need. Second is a lack of the financial commitment that's necessary to truly address the problem. Although we've invested more money, it really isn't remotely close to enough. I think third is a regulatory issue. It relates to unauthorized practice of law, but it's not limited to that. I think other countries have experimented with other kinds of legal professionals, not completely unregulated, but authorized and regulated categories of legal professionals, much as we see in healthcare. It's not just doctors who are authorized and regulated to deliver some kinds of healthcare services. It's other kinds of healthcare professionals. We haven't really gone down that path very far, except in a few small instances around the country. I think that's another promising opportunity to address these issues. And then finally, and I know we're going to talk about this in quite a bit more detail, is technology. There are various ways in which we can embrace technology to scale up some of the existing resources that exist and solutions that exist. So although the three traditional solutions haven't really borne out very well, I think there are some ways in which we can address the problems that exist that we really haven't focused on with enough seriousness. Thank you both so much for such a comprehensive overview of the problems that we face. And I said we were going to get to legal education later, but if you'll permit me, I'm going to jump in here and build on what you just said, Andy, and suggest that also educational foundations in the problem, the scope, the magnitude, and the way of approaching it. And again, it's as though Jim is on this podcast with us because one thing that had not occurred to me until maybe 15 years into my career is that law schools tend to focus more on federal appellate case law. And as Bridget mentioned, most of civil justice is distributed in state court systems. And the other thing that you know we've worked on together, Bridget, with Jim is a focus on human-centered design of legal systems. So I'm curious, Andy, as somebody who is at the helm of a law school, thinks a lot about legal education, are there ways that we could contribute more in the first year at the outset of somebody's experience as a lawyer to helping them understand the problems and then equipping them with mindsets and tools that could start attacking the problems in different ways? Uh, it's a good question. I think there are lots of ways that we can build in solutions to these problems throughout law school, thinking about it and the pervasive method of instruction. In the first year of law school, it would be nice for students to just know about the problems that Bridget described. Some of these facts and figures, I sometimes will cite them during orientation when I welcome students to law school, that they should be aware of the problems that exist and that their obligation is going to be to try to address them. The other way that I think we can start to incorporate this in the first year of law school and then throughout, and I know we'll talk later about 
other ways in which we can approach this issue later in law school and, of course, in practice is what I'd like to refer to as a new kind of issue spotting. So law school, particularly in the first year, teaches students how to spot issues of various kinds, property, contracts, torts, you name it. The idea is that we don't expect lawyers and law students to remember just a bunch of doctrine and be able to spit it back. You want there to be pattern recognition, to be able to recognize that when a client is facing a particular problem, It's a problem of a particular sort. You're going to need to research it. You're going to need to look into it, find out the specifics of that jurisdiction, but you'll recognize it because it's an issue that you've seen. What I think we can start to do, not only in the first year of law school, but throughout law school, is to help students spot the issue of legal services delivery and delivering it better, faster, and cheaper. Because I would like for them to be introduced to the tools, the resources, the innovative mindset that will allow them to deliver any kind of legal service in a new and better way that more effectively serves the public's needs, whether they're paying clients or people, the public who cannot afford legal services right now. And so what I would love to be able to see is law students learning, starting in their first year, the mindset that enables them when they graduate, regardless of what area of law they practice in, they're going to see a service and they're going to say, you know what? There is a better, faster, and cheaper way for us to do this. And I know that because I learned some of the basic concepts in law school. So I think that's a new area that we haven't really traditionally explored that can help to address some of these problems. I might hop in here. I agree completely with Andy. There's so many interesting ways to take this conversation right now. But I think, Jen, you've heard me say it before that I wish that some law school dean would make the entire first two weeks of 1L year, be students sitting in a debt collection docket, followed by an eviction docket, followed by a bond hearing docket, the state, the busy state court dockets where I honestly believe most lawyers would be shocked to see what's happening in our state courts every day. And it will right away put the one-to-one model that we that most of us think about in the legal profession. You know, the one-to-one model is not one that is ever going to work to address the civil justice problem. And I think students showing up at law schools with diverse backgrounds who, you know, don't yet know that one-to-one model at the start of their legal career, seeing the problem, like seeing it with their eyes, right? With seeing the look on people's faces in those courtrooms where, if they've shown up, they'll see, first of all, that a lot of people don't show up. But if they've shown up, they don't usually understand most of what's happening when it happens to them, would be a tremendous way to start a legal education aimed at setting them into the profession with the skills Andy is talking about. Because I don't believe these problems are unsolvable. I believe we haven't given lawyers the tools to solve them, in large part because of the model that lawyering takes. And frankly, that's the model that that we learn in 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 the cases that they read in their law school classes. Like you said, they're largely federal cases, but even when they're not federal cases, if they're cases from state appellate courts, they're cases where people were represented by lawyers, even though that's not generally what happens in state courts, right? And it's not what's happening that's causing the largest threat to the public's confidence in what happens in state courts. So that's my fantasy for if someone wants to make me a law school dean for <laughs> one year. That's what I'm going to do. I think you'd find plenty of schools that would make you a dean for longer than that. A hundred percent agree. And, you know, it really goes back to that point that we made, that Jim made through all of us at the beginning of the systems being designed by lawyers for lawyers. And of course, we all know that people think of the first year of law school because they are told this about the first year of law school, that it teaches you how to think like a lawyer. And I think to your point, Bridget, helping people think like a self-represented litigant or somebody who's the stake for whom the stakes are so high that their entire life really depends on the outcome of a matter that is really almost impossible to navigate on their own, I think situates the service orientation at the outset in a way that could change mindsets. And I wanted to home in on one point that you made very early on, Bridget, because I didn't want to gloss over it. I think it will be relevant for our conversation about technology is the poor data on state court activity outcomes And could you just describe briefly what accounts for our inability to really capture, analyze, and understand what's happening in state courts? 
Yeah. And I bet there, I bet you can get future podcast guests who could do that with more articulately than I can, and maybe with even better understanding. But, you know, most state court systems are not unified. There are some that are unified and in the unified state court systems, they tend to have better data because there is a one, one technology unifying all of the courts throughout the state. But in most states, and Michigan's a great example of this, we have various case management systems throughout the state. And there is only the only tools you have as the state Supreme Court that's charged, again, with administrative oversight of the courts of state are sort of carrots and sticks to kind of move the different state, the different trial courts to case management systems where we could aggregate data to, to better understand trends. So in Michigan, we have 83 counties and we're down to, I think, 20 different case management systems. We built kind of a back end, the court worked to build kind of a back end data warehouse where even different trial court systems could send their data and then we could try and figure out how to aggregate it and see trends. But as you can imagine, just listening to me, you're both probably already like falling asleep. It's complicated and has limited efficiency. I worry a little bit that it's a feature, not a bug. You know, there's a lot of learning that could be done if we really just collected data and made it transparent to scholars, to people who were interested in figuring out new solutions to technologists. And that would require some political will because, you know, we're funded by another branch of government and it would, you know, require real money, probably at least to, to build the infrastructure to, to kind of collect that data. But it seems to me that if you did it, you'd obviously have better tools to build better solutions, but many states haven't done it yet. So, so if I could just stay for one minute before we jump into technology and generative AI on that point of incentives, we've talked with our colleagues at Penn in our work together, Bridget, about some of the third-party insurers driving efficiency, innovation in healthcare, which has its own problems, but there is a force that is pushing the organizations and the paraprofessionals and doctors to think differently. How do we create incentives like that in legal? You've referenced the political challenges. Is it a, a political challenge exclusively? Is it a lack of awareness among the general public? I think of things like the cost of higher education or the cost of health care, which people use as a reason to cast a vote for one candidate or the other. But it seems like there isn't the outrage around lack of accessibility that you referenced earlier. So how do we create better incentives to drive change? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm hoping Andy has a really short, <laughs> pithy answer that we can just, you know, put into action as soon as we finish this podcast. It is interesting that you can move public opinion on healthcare and it hasn't worked as well in civil justice, even though it seems to me the right to civil justice should be fundamental and it should motivate the public in ways they're motivated on other issues. And I, again, you know, think it's a little bit of a feature and not a bug of the systems we've built when they're so complicated and impossible for people to understand unless they can spend, what does law school cost nowadays, Andy, $300,000 to learn the special language and the special rules. I think most people give up before figuring out how to build systems and even, you know, collaborations that could bring the kind of change that probably is needed. I don't know. Andy, do you have thoughts on that? I, yeah, I, I am, I am somewhat theory. skeptical that we're ever going to be able to align the incentives because I think a lot of people have tried. I think the unfortunate reality is that we have a culture and society that is just not that committed to helping people with their problems. I mean, I just it's a deep cultural mm -hmm. problem. It's not something we're going to be able to fix in this very specific instance. I think it's much deeper than that. So, and it comes back to what the solution might be. If we're skeptical, and maybe I'm being unnecessarily pessimistic here, but if it's true that moving that needle is going to be really hard, and I tend to think it would be, then that leads us down a different path for the solution, which is trying to find technology and other innovative ways for accessing legal services. And I think that has the most promise and will have the biggest impact in the shorter term, because I think this project of getting people to really genuinely care about those in need is going to be a much harder exercise. So that's why I'm more excited about 
technology and innovation as a way to address these solutions and some of the deeper cultural and political problems. And your answer, Andy, is, oh, yeah, sorry, can, Bridget, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, it, I, I have to agree completely that technology feels like a much faster path, right? I mean, I, not, which isn't to say that it's simple either, but it definitely feels like a potentially significantly faster path to solution. And your answer, Andy, is echoing another one of our mutual friends, Jordan Furlong, who visited one of our sessions and said exactly the same thing that you said, which is it is a cultural problem about caring less about our neighbors over time. And that is a much harder thing to fix. But is Leave it to the Canadian to point out the problem with America. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so with that, uh, on that somewhat somber note, I would like to pivot to something that I think we all share hope about, which is technology. And of course, we're all hyper aware of generative AI and are thinking and excited about it and concerned and have lots of different questions about it. But I want to zoom out and be more broad about technology and start with you, Andy, because you have been thinking about these issues and practicing what you preach and think about in your work at Suffolk for much longer than most people have been thinking about technology. So I'm curious about why you started down a path of really leading in using technology to expand access to legal services and also integrating technology actively into legal education. So could you tell us where you were inspired and why you yeah, began? Yeah, I would say I was inspired. There are many different reasons, but I think what ultimately inspired me was seeing how far behind we were in understanding how these tools can be effective in delivering the services that the public needs. And it relates to the last question that you had asked and that we were just talking about. It was a recognition that the traditional solutions were just not doing the work that we needed. Because I would see these LSC studies that would come out periodically, and the numbers were moving in the wrong direction. And so I was thinking, well, what can we do as a law school, as a law professor, and then as a dean? What could I do to help address this problem? And there are those out there who think it's got to be the one-to-one -one model that Bridget was describing earlier, lawyer to client. And I am just not optimistic that is going to lead to the kinds of solutions that we need. So, so that started to get me thinking, what can a law school do to train future lawyers to help address that problem? And at the same time, I saw for a variety of reasons in connection with my work at the ABA, first with the ABA's Commission on Ethics 2020, which updated the rules of professional conduct in light of technology and globalization, and then through the Center for Innovation, the extent to which technology had the potential to transform what we do. And so as a law school, particularly one at Suffolk that has long been focused on a practice-oriented legal education, it seemed to me that the practice-oriented legal education of the present and the future had to include an understanding of the ways in which technology and innovative methods can be used in service of the clients and public we serve. So those were the motivating factors. And since then, starting about 10 years ago, we launched the nation's first legal innovation and technology concentration. And I should just say a word about this because when people say legal technology in law schools, I think there's often a misunderstanding. I'm going to mention here a real legend in this field, someone named Mark Lauritsen, who once pointed out to me the difference between the law of technology, which includes things like intellectual property, cybersecurity law, and a variety of other subjects that are at the law of technology versus the technology of law practice, which is ubiquitous and it cuts across every area of practice. We wanted to focus on the second category. That's what this legal innovation and technology concentration is all about, teaching students the knowledge and skills they will need to deliver their services in a more effective and efficient way in the future. So we started teaching legal project management, process improvement, automated document assembly, design thinking. This was 10 years ago, really before many people were thinking about these kinds of issues. And since then, we have really invested in a number of other areas that are both designed to give our students some of the knowledge and skills, but also try to make an impact in terms of access to justice. And probably the premier aspect of that is our Legal Innovation and Technology Lab, which for all intents and purposes is a new kind of clinic where our clients, if you want to call them clients, are court systems, legal service providers, and we help them do the one-to-many and make that transition and automate, 
commonly used legal forms. For example, we had a project with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in helping them automate a number of different commonly used legal forms, especially while the courthouse was closed during the pandemic. And we are working now with more than a half dozen other states on automating their court forms, doing the same. This is not generative AI. It's what you might call old-fashioned AI or technology, just audio, you know, in a TurboTax-like way, automa- automating basic forms so that the public has easier access to the information and services that they need. So there are a variety of other initiatives we've undertaken since then, but I really believe that law schools now and in the future are going to have to embrace this reality if they hope to prepare their students for the world they're going to enter. And I know, go ahead, Bridget. Yeah, no, I've been a citizen of a lot of law schools. I went to NYU. I taught at Yale. I taught at Michigan for 15 years. I was associate dean at Michigan. Now I've taught at Penn for a couple of years. And I don't know of any law school doing what Suffolk's doing. So there just isn't another law school doing that out there. So I have not been to as many law schools as Bridget has, but I've observed a lot in the last 10 years in my roles at Penn and would wholeheartedly agree And really applaud you for working with the technology that you had 10 years ago to build the muscle that prepares you and your colleagues in your community now, I think, to step into the next generation of technologies. And of course, we're just a little bit over a year into the generative AI era. And so I'd love to start with you, Andy, as somebody who has really seen the evolution of using technology in the practice of law and ask you whether you think generative AI is different in nature and in potential scope of impact than the technology you're accustomed to using to date? I think it's a potential accelerator for some of the trends we've been talking about. There are certainly some downsides. There are ways in which generative AI still needs to mature. I think we are in that kind of Gartner hype cycle that people talk about in terms of the trough of disillusionment. I think people are going to be somewhat disappointed after the initial hype that it's going to take a little while before Generative AI and similar technologies have the impact that many people, including myself, think that it will. But at the end of the day, generative AI is going to be the most transformative technology for the legal profession of any technology ever invented. I'm going to be bold. It's about as bold as I can be, but I I think it will be. You just think of what generative AI does. It's able to absorb enormous amounts of information, organize it in structured ways, logical ways, and and produce really professional level writing. Certainly that's not what all lawyers do. We do a lot more than that, but it's a significant part of what many lawyers do. And it's certainly a big part of what many people need when they need routine legal services. And so if generative AI can facilitate that process of generating information and documents, that's really transformative. And I think it can be transformative in two ways. First, given to lawyers who know how to properly use it, and we can get into a long conversation about the proper and ethical use of generative AI, but if properly and ethically used, it can really help lawyers scale up their work to reach more people and help each individual client in the way that those clients need and do it more efficiently so that you can actually represent even more clients. So if you're a legal aid lawyer, for example, if generative AI can allow you to produce the information you need more rapidly, you'd be able to help more people or professionals on your staff to help more people. So that's number one. The other way is, of course, self-help, enabling people to access the information and services that they need themselves. I'll just give you one very simple example. And I actually, I'll give you two examples. So one, it was built by our Legal Innovation and Technology Lab. And I do have to give a big shout out to the people who run that lab, David Calaruso and Quentin Stainhouse. They are just absolutely fantastic, as well as our assistant dean, Gabe Tenenbaum, and the director of the concentration that I mentioned, Diane O'Leary. The work that we're doing at the end of the day, as much as we talk about technology, you need the humans who are really committed to the work and know how to do it. And we are just very fortunate to have people who are doing that work really well. So in this context, they have found a very creative use of generative AI. They built a tool that's called Rate My PDF. And the idea is you upload a PDF court form and it will analyze it, suggest ways where the language might be misunderstood or improved to make it more accessible, right? That's just a very simple use case. But so many court forms that the public have that uses are incomprehensible. 
And so you could say, analyze this court form, make it accessible to somebody with a third grade education or somebody who is not a native English speaker. And that is easy to do. So that's one example of ways in which we can make forms, commonly used forms, more accessible to the public using generative AI. A second, and this one is something I did myself. So OpenAI made available a new custom GPT service. You can create your own version of ChatGPT. I decided to create essentially a legal triage tool, a legal resource finder. And I gave it some custom instructions about what to do. And all you have to do is, I, you know, I'm getting kicked out of my apartment or my house is in foreclosure or whatever the legal problem is. It will then ask you, because I told it to do this, what jurisdiction are you in? So, and then you answer that question and it might ask you a couple of other follow-up questions and then gives you a list of the available resources in your jurisdiction with links or phone numbers. Terrific. I mean, I, you could try to do that yourself using Google or available resources online. They're hit or miss. And there are a lot of states that tried to build triage tools of different kinds, but they can get out of date in a hurry and they're difficult to build. This is just ready-made for that kind of triage. And that's just another simple way that we can direct people to the resources that already exist, because sometimes the resources are there and people just don't know how to access them. So those are just a couple of very simple examples. And I think there are going to be many more in the future. Those are great examples. Thank you for sharing. And I'm going to come down to you, Bridget, and ask you for your thoughts as well to build on Andy's. I will just say, I haven't seen Bridget in a few weeks, and I like to trade use cases that I'm discovering with the GPTs that you just mentioned, Andy. And this is non-legal, but I used it last night to help me with my fourth graders, third graders math homework. I could not figure it out because it's new math. I don't know how to do it, but it's making me think of it with the rate my PDF. I took a picture of it and asked me to exp- asked it to help me to explain it to an eight-year-old. And it did much better than I would have done. So I could see the use cases as well that you're talking about there. So Bridget, I'm going to turn it to you to build on Andy's points about generative AI. Yeah, Andy, Jen and I have been building these GPTs for our own like personal lives. So it's been fun for us to like trade our personal GPT <laughs> stories. It, we, we did a similar exercise at the AAA for all of our forms and products for people representing themselves in mediations and arbitrations. We asked a, a GPT to rewrite all of those at a reading level of a third grader, a sixth grader, an eighth grader, things that we probably could have sorted through on our own, but I wouldn't be so confident and certainly couldn't have done it as quickly. It was just in a really easy way to improve some of our processes. But Jen, let me frame out from the question for a minute. And I think Andy talked about this a little bit before, but it, even without the new and I think completely agree with Andy, game-changing possibilities that generative AI is going to put on the table for the legal profession. And I think for the civil justice crisis we've been talking about, just the, the ability for technology, just tech, just regular technology, and then, you know, old-fashioned AI that doesn't produce new content to scale up solutions is really tremendous. And the legal profession has just been behind in in using all of it, I think, to make a difference. So, you know, just for one example of how just plain old technology can scale solutions, you know, we learned during the pandemic that legal aid lawyers could represent in Michigan, we, they, we actually ran the numbers seven times as many people in eviction cases, when they were able to do it, you know, on a remote platform, um, because they could do one hearing after another, and seven times as many people received legal help. To me, that was a you know case closed on whether we should continue to do remote hearings. Of course we should, right? If seven times as many people got legal help, of course we had to keep doing it. There were no special AI involved, just video conferencing. I mean, you know, probably could have been doing that 20 years ago, but it took a pandemic to learn that. And another example, you know, we know that the single reason people are most likely to remember that they have a court date, whether it's a court date to make a payment or to appear in person, is if they get a text reminder. It's not whether they have a job. It's not whether they have stable housing. It's not whether they have other ties to the community. It's literally whether they get reminded on their phone. The same reason why you go to the dentist is the reason why you might remember to go to court. And so if you build a very simple text reminder tool, which does not take complicated AI technology, you can change justice outcomes for large groups of people. Oftentimes, it's just the difference between showing up or not showing up that changes the outcome for people. So so I just want to remind us that there are tech solutions that we can be making progress on even without having to learn the potential benefits of generative AI, but we will have to learn those as well. 
And then the one thing I want to say that I completely agree with Andy on the easy use cases on generative AI. And one of the big, big problems that I'm not sure I articulated well enough earlier for the large group of people that are not going to have one-to-one representation, but we're not going to pro bono our way out of this problem, is figuring out what the law requires of them and provides for them. Imagine being someone who didn't go to law school and has a legal problem, which most people do at some point in their lives, often many points in their lives, and having to figure out what the law requires of you or provides for you. We keep the law in these weird, long opinions that judges write that, by the way, are not free, even if you could figure out how to find them and read them, you have to apparently pay some weird provider money to get access to them. I know there's some workarounds and I know there's been some progress on that, but you know what I mean? But even so, imagine trying to like sort through them and figure out what the law is. Understanding what the law is super hard to do. In addition to case law, there are statutes. And, you know, have you ever tried to like figure out without understanding Westlaw or Lexis, what statute applies to a particular legal problem. It's really hard with Google. It is really hard to do. And then in addition to that, there are rules, right? Courts issue rules. Some of them are rules of professional conduct, rules of evidence, rules of civil procedure, rules of criminal procedure. Sometimes individual judges have different rules that sort of overlap with the state's rules and sometimes don't. They're sometimes in conflict. Imagine being someone who had to work through all of those different areas of answers, right, to your legal problem and try and make sense of them so you could understand it. There's no way you're going to give up right away. And the idea that we could move in the direction of kind of a legal singularity is one of the things that excites me the most, that we can, I think, with this, with the capabilities of generative AI, find our way to an understandable set of rules that people can understand and play English is one of, I think, the most enormous possibilities. That's sort of at a theoretical level. There are lots of use cases we could continue to talk about, but I just wanted to, I want to get I that I wholeheartedly in here. agree with Bridget, uh, including the point that generative AI, as much potential as there is with it, there it's just one small, well, I shouldn't say small, it's one category under the larger category of technology that can improve the delivery of legal services. And I think there is a good and healthy amount of attention to generative AI right now, but we shouldn't lose sight of all of the other really impactful solutions that are out there. The very good example that Bridget gave about text messaging is a good one. And the turbo taxing of legal forms, just automating in a more old fashioned way, because that technology has been around for decades, can really make a difference for people because then you can ask them questions in a way that they would understand and it converts their answers into usable forms right away. Those are the kinds of solutions that really can make an enormous difference for people. So as promising as I think generative AI is and will be, we shouldn't lose sight of those other solutions as well. 100% agree with both of you, as you probably know, and we won't really spend a lot of time on this today, but I think it goes to the other point that we've talked about in past conversations of interdisciplinarity and being inspired by solutions in other fields and maybe unexpected places. I get more text message alerts from my nail salon (laughs) than I do from a courthouse. And (laughs) I know exactly when my appointment is because they never stop pestering me about when my appointment is. But looking for those sort of unexpected ways that we could make things better using the technology that we have And recognizing that many people listening are probably aware of generative AI, may have played around with it a little bit, but might not be really fully steeped in its applications or thought deeply about it. And I don't know if you're like me, but every lawyer I talk to brings up the chat GPT lawyer as a cautionary tale as to why we shouldn't be going down this road at all. And so I'd love to sort of offer the opportunity to respond and also offer your thoughts on some of the, Andy, you said proper and ethical use of these technologies, your thoughts on what that looks like for lawyers listening. And I'll start with you, Andy. Yes. Let's talk about that New York case, because obviously people love to talk about it. And too many people use it as a reason why lawyers should not be using generative AI. That is exactly the wrong conclusion to draw from that case. The right conclusion to draw from that case is that if you're going to use generative AI, you have to use it carefully uh, because it can make things up. It can hallucinate. You have to check every word, every idea. Of course you do. Just as if you used a paralegal or summer associate 
to generate work for you, you'd want to check it to make sure that it's accurate. So there, we always, as lawyers, have this duty of supervision and making sure that anything we submit with the court it meets the standards that apply to us. And we can have another side conversation about whether the court orders out there from judges saying that lawyers have to disclose when they've used generative AI, whether those are misguided. I tend to think they are. But I, the point here is I think it is the wrong conclusion to think that case stands for the proposition that lawyers shouldn't use generative AI. In fact, I will go one step beyond and say that I don't think it's going to be two years from now, but perhaps more like 10 years from now, we will get to the point where we say not only is it competence to use generative AI or lawyers can use generative AI competently, it will be expected that lawyers use generative AI and lawyers who don't use it will be considered incompetent in much the same way that lawyers today would be viewed as incompetent if they pulled out a typewriter to type up a brief or didn't have an email address. And a great analogy here is actually emails because it was 20, 25 years ago where bar associations were issuing ethics opinions saying that lawyers shouldn't use email. It's too sent too dangerous to reveal confidential information. Now, we've at a point that many bars require lawyers to have email addresses. I think we are going to see a similar evolution for generative AI. We're going to go from being, oh, you've got to be really careful if you're going to use this technology, to eventually we're going to say, of course you have to use it. How could you possibly imagine opening up Microsoft Word or your favorite word processing tool to a blank screen and then starting to type? What a waste of clients' money and time. I think we will eventually reach that point. Yeah, I completely agree. That lawyer in New York, he set us back, you know, I don't know, six (laughs) months in the profession and like thinking about how we should be thinking about this new technology. I mean, I get it. Technology always seems to be hard for the legal profession to embrace quickly. And I think there are some cultural reasons for that. You know, we went to law school because we were afraid of science school. But I think there are also some normative reasons for that. You know, we are risk adverse by nature and for good reason. And I understand all the reasons why we are slow to dip our toes into a new tech into new technologies. But that story was a story about that lawyer and not about the technology. That's all there is. And I'm a little worried that some of these court orders make, you know, the courts look like they don't understand pretty basic technologies because your Grammarly program has AI built into it. And so does your Microsoft Copilot. You might not have that yet because it's still so expensive, but your but some of the law firms do, right? And, you know, I think we learned this week that the Mistral LLMs can be downloaded onto your computer and onto your phone without being connected to the internet. So you might have... AIs working on all of your work. And I don't, I guess the only way to comply with some of those court orders is going to be to start handwriting your pleadings. And that's, that can't be the direction we want to head in. And I don't like it when courts <laughs> make it look like we don't, we, that like judges don't understand what's happening in the world. It's pretty important for judges and courts to understand what's happening in the world. And I don't, I'm a little worried about those orders. So I don't, you know, yes, there are, of course, important risks in when you're using it. And like Andy said, if you had a, as a judge, if I had a clerk drafting a memo for me, I wouldn't circulate it to my colleagues without making sure they got it right. And you know what, they didn't always get it right. And that's your job. The same if you're a partner in a law firm, even with a first or second year associate, not only a summer associate, right? I mean, you, it's your job if it's going out under your name to make sure it's accurate. So I don't know why the current rules we have aren't good enough to help us manage what is clearly a new technology, but not one I think that our rules don't help us manage. Let me um, just briefly, if I, I we could spend an hour talking about this or more, but maybe briefly ask you on the second point that you made, Andy, earlier about self-help and using generative AI for self-help and the regulatory impacts there. When you were talking about the personalized GPT you created that generated a list of legal resources. I started thinking about what I've heard a lot of people talk about as the next chapter, which is agentized generative AI. So you ask a question to your GPT, I'm being evicted. What are some resources? It generates the resources and then it goes a step further and it reaches out to a local office or it drafts, you know, some sort of response on your behalf. 
what does what do the regulators do then do you predict as these technologies become more advanced and are actually taking actions on behalf of self-represented people such a good question and i won't pretend to have all the answers i mean on the one hand it sounds very scary and understandably so this idea for artificial AI agents going out and taking actions on our behalf without them being properly supervised, especially in areas like legal services where there are enormous implications. This is not the Google service that makes a reservation at a restaurant for you. This is a lot more serious with greater implications. So, you know, there is a reason to be concerned about these autonomous gen AI tools acting on our behalf in matters that are important and consequential. So I get that. And we do have, we probably will have to regulate in that area. And my go-to is not usually regulation, but that there probably will need to be some guidelines and controls over that. At the same time there, I think there's this instinct of saying absolutely not never, which I think is the wrong solution on the other extreme, because I think we always have to ask, and this is the question that I think doesn't get asked enough when we're talking about technology of any kind, which is relative to what? So just to take it out of the legal arena for a second, self-driving cars, people say self-driving cars, they're not ready for prime time, they cause accidents. That's not the right question. It's not whether they cause accidents, it's whether they cause fewer accidents than human drivers. Because if they do, we could save a lot of lives, like 50,000 people a year die in car accidents. If we had self-driving cars for everyone, would it be 30,000? If so, that's fine. Yeah, 30,000, it would still cause 30,000 deaths, but that's better than 50,000. So I think the, the we have to always think about it in those terms. So coming back to your question, when we're thinking about autonomous AIs, we would have to certainly make sure there are appropriate controls in place. But before saying never, we'd have to ask, well, might it do more good than harm relative to the current state of affairs? If the answer is yes, then let's figure out a way to use it. Yeah, I'm going to pile on. I mean, agree again. I, maybe this is getting boring. I'll be agree <laughs> again. But I mean, I always think, you know, what would someone say who had the choice, a generative AI tool who would be able to help her if she was facing an eviction versus nothing? And But you could tell her, you know, the generative AI tool might not get the, you know, the rule exactly right. It might, you know, not understand that there's a, you know, separate rule than the city of Detroit versus the, you know, county of Wayne. And, you know, so you might not, you know, get it quite right. And if I'm, if I'm that person facing an eviction and my choice is nothing or a generative AI agent that could at least get me started, I think I'll take door two. So I worry a little bit that when we expect perfection before, you know, when the perfect is the enemy of the good, the people who suffer are not us, but, you know, the great majority of Americans who right now don't have any help with their legal problems and most of the time give up. Well, I think we can all agree that we'll start to see some really interesting cases unfolding and we can follow along and see how the regulators respond, certainly in the years ahead. So I want to shift a little bit from thinking about the near and distant future to thinking about the present. I know you're both thinking collaboratively about how we can use these technologies to scale A to J, access to justice, in the world that we live in now. Would you be open to sharing a little bit about what you're working on? And I'm going to start with Bridget (laughs) on this one. Yeah. Well, so first of all, let me just say that we're just, we're at the, we're at the beginning stages and my goal is to just find some way to work with the talented team at Suffolk because I think they're the best team in the country to, you know, at the forefront of using and thinking about the way, again, technology, even before AI or generative AI can be a scalable solution to lots of justice problems. And so we've been meeting my team at the AAA and Andy's really talented team at Suffolk on thinking about a collaboration around a family law pilot in the local courts near Suffolk, where his team has great relationships, where we can combine some of our resources and think about some new solutions that will involve some technology. It's not clear where generative AI will fit in or even whether it will fit in the first instance with some new solutions that will draw on some of the expertise we have for diversion at the AAA and Andy's team's technological expertise. So I'm pretty optimistic that we're going to find a way to work together 
and put together the what I think are two talented teams and come up with some new solutions. Our hope is that if we build something successful, we at the AAA can, you know, measure the crap out of it. That's not a technical legal term. That's just what we want to do so that we can then talk about it and take it on the road and show other jurisdictions that there are solutions to some of the problems that people are facing that they can't, that lawyers are not going to be able to solve, but we can build solutions for. So that, that that's an important part of it from our end. We want to be able to measure it and show the world yeah, what just, we're doing. Uh, add on to what Bridget said, really got to give them a lot of kudos at AAA for conceiving of this idea and this potential collaboration. Excited to see where it will go. And it's really potentially illustrative, not only about similar collaborations around the country doing similar work, but also I think a pathway for similar kinds of partnerships between law schools and other parties where we can make a difference. I don't think any of us believe that we can solve the access to justice problem with one solution or one type of provider. If we're really going to make a dent, it's going to require a lot of different ideas coming together and different people working on it who have various and diverse areas of expertise. And I think this is a model for other kinds of collaborations that can really make a difference. So I'm excited for it, for that reason, among many others. That's fantastic. I'm excited to watch it unfold and wholeheartedly agree, Andy, when there are novel partnerships among fantastic humans. It sparks so many great ideas and also enthusiasm, I think, among other people who might be a little hesitant to try something new. So I'm sure that others will learn a great deal from both of you. And Bridget, you mentioned the AAA, and I know you are always thinking about how to innovate and think creatively about expanding legal services. How are you thinking about generative AI and technology in the alternative dispute resolution space? Yeah, thanks for that question too. It's a, I think it's a really exciting time for the, you know, I think of the AAA as a nonprofit, but you know, we're providing private dispute resolution services in that that always are aimed at assisting the public dispute resolution system. So I don't think courts on their own are going to ever be able ever to be able to perfectly meet the needs of all of the people with justice problems. And we've seen diversion solutions be a, a big help in lots of different areas. In the last couple of years, the eviction diversion programs have given us all kinds of interesting, stories to tell and some data that shows what a difference a diversion program can make, whether it's mediation or conciliation or even arbitration. So the AAA is doing a bunch of different experiments. We just announced a, actually a generative AI lab, and we have three new products rolling off of it in the next few weeks. And we are looking at partnerships like this one with Suffolk that I'm really excited about, other ways where we can partner and provide new and scalable services, diversion services, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, and some of it probably online and AI enabled that will give people new avenues for resolving disputes. You know, there are lots of disputes right now that just don't have a home. They don't have a place to go. And the people, organizations, and even businesses, small and medium businesses often don't have access to lawyers or ways to resolve disputes I think there's a there, this is an exciting time because there's a lot of new systems that can be built to deliver a home for some of those disputes. And if we can come through them with people feeling more satisfied about how their dispute was resolved, I think it's kind of better for all of us. So we have lot, lots of fun stuff. That's happening. fantastic. So many great projects happening. And I'm excited to watch both of you lead a variety of things in the years ahead and learn from you. Maybe you'll come back for a future episode for an update on all of these projects. We're about out of time, but as we head out, I would love to ask each of you, you know, it, it's a, it's sort of an overwhelming time, I think, for a lot of people as they're sort of trying to practice law, trying to take care of their clients' needs in the present and also get their arms around generative AI. And there are a lot of misconceptions about what generative AI can do, what it can't do. What is one thing that you would say to the audience about what generative AI is capable of doing and or what it's not capable of doing that people maybe think it is? And Andy, I'm going to start with you if you're open to it. 
and then come back to Bridget? Yeah. So any answer that I give now could be outdated in a matter of weeks or days. (laughs) So with that proviso, I think one area where generative AI is quite good is summarizing information and lots of information and really distilling it, presenting it in an easy to understand way. I think it's really good at brainstorming ideas for phrasing clauses, either in litigation documents, transactional documents. I have used it many times myself in those and other arenas. And I just think that it is really compelling as a way to brainstorm ideas so and to distill information. In terms of what it can't do yet, important emphasis on the word yet is that it is not great, depending on the context, not great at drafting documents, whether it's litigation documents or transactional documents. But with appropriate prompting, I have seen it do some pretty remarkable work, even in those arenas, whether it's drafting a complaint or drafting a transactional document. I think it would surprise many people. So although I think the use cases there are currently somewhat limited, I think the potential even there is going to be substantial. And I know there are a lot of companies already working on those solutions and some that have already been launched. So I think those are some future use cases, but people have to be careful about using it that way right now. There are many others. I think people are getting kind of creative about it. There's one product out there that, for example, will help you brainstorm deposition topics and questions to ask a deponent just as an example. So really, you could go down the list of almost any kind of service within the legal industry, and you could probably find a good use case. I'll close with this, that for those who are feeling overwhelmed, one big picture point is nobody's figured this out yet, really in a serious way, but don't use that as an excuse not to try. I think people should start to use these tools in just general ways to get to see how they work. Very importantly, see how different the responses are depending on the prompts that you use. People call it prompt engineering, but just this idea of you really can get some quite good responses if you know how to ask relative to what some people give up on it right away and say, oh, it's just not good at that. Look, this was a lousy answer. But the reality is if you ask in a different way, it'll give you a much better answer. It's not unlike being a parent, talking to your child. (laughs) If you ask the wrong way, they're going to give you the answer you don't want. You have to know how to ask. And so generative AI is at kind of its infancy stage. So I I think there's a lot to the question you asked, Jen. And so those are just some preliminary thoughts. Parenting as prompt engineer. I like that. There's an article in there. (laughs) Bridget, what are your thoughts? So I get that it's an overwhelming time. I think it, I honestly feel like everything is speeding up and even in my world, such that I'm having a hard time keeping up just with it, the incoming and all the things I want to be working on and all the projects I, I feel like I need to learn a little bit more to do better at. So I understand that. I do think there's a reason for that. I think that this technology is especially useful in the legal profession already. Again, not perfect, as we've talked about, but you know, lawyers, are our main currency is words. We have a lot of structured texts. And this is a technology that's built on words. And so it is, you know, we are one of the first professions, I think, that can see a lot of upside potential. Idea generation, it is off the charts for. You know, we have an innovation practice at the AAA. Every single one of the 700 employees has had innovation training, you know, a half-day training. And we do a lot of idea generation exercises with every staff member. And GPT-4 puts our group idea generation to shame. Like it just comes up with, you know, twice as many in 10 seconds as the ideas our groups come up with. That's okay. We, we've just started using it to supplement what we're doing. And it often helps us generate even better ideas when you just put it in the room with you when you're doing idea generation. But I think overall, it's, it is already not a good idea for lawyers to put their heads in the sand about this technology. I think you don't have to... You don't have to get your arms around what the best use cases are. You don't have to get your arms even around which products you think, you know, your law firm or your court system should be using. But I do think you have to have a team that's starting to play with it, sharing use cases, talking about the threats and opportunities that it brings to your organization. And you should start that right away because I think it's really going to have a large impact on the business of law, 
the practice of law and the delivery of justice. So let's not shy away from it. And and we can measure the crap out of everything that we're learning along the way. <laughs> the crap out of it. Yep. Well, it's the perfect note to end on. And I want to thank both of you during these overwhelming times for being so grateful with your time, energy, and thoughts and sharing them with our audience. I want to thank everybody out there listening for being so generous with your time and spending it with us on PLI's Fast Tracked Podcast. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us on Fast Track. I hope you enjoyed this fascinating conversation as much as I did. Visit pli.edu for more insights, education, and resources for navigating this dynamic landscape. And until next time, stay curious and stay adaptable as we work together to chart a course into an exciting future.